afternoon. Thank you for, uh, for joining us today. <clears throat> you know, before we get to the sort of the, the meat of the press conference today, I want to talk just, just a few moments about kind of how we got here. A little bit, just a tad bit about uh, sometimes what's not talked about very much, a little bit of background and, and whatnot. So, <clears throat> um, this, the deficit we're in is not new. Uh, we, uh, in 2013, is the first year we were in a budget deficit in, in Alaska, so it's been since 2013. Uh, in the 2013, the budget was $7.8 billion, and the 2018 budget that's submitted by uh, our office as well as with the House's budget is 4.3. So we've gone from $7.8 billion in 2013 down to 4.3 in 2018. <clears throat> and tw since 2015, we've reduced the budget by $1.7 billion. So it's a $3.4 billion total reduction. Pretty significant. I mean, it's a really significant budget. I, I've talked to other governors that talk about a 3 or 4% cut in their budget, and it's, and it's, a, it's a big deal. So this, this is, these are significant uh, steps that have been taken. The three big top departments that have been reduced, the Department of Commerce reduced by 54%, Department of Labor uh, reduced by 37%, and Fish and Game reduced by 36%. These are, these are big, big reductions in, in these departments. We've closed over 40 state facilities across the state. Uh, we, um, some time ago we had a press conference in here. I went through the whole list. I read the whole list. I'm not going to do that today. But they include uh, prisons, uh, youth detention facilities, uh, DMV offices, OCS uh, offices, um, over 70 uh, state uh, programs that are funded by the state of Alaska have been discontinued. Um, I'm not going to go through that list of, of the 70 programs, but it's, it's significant. <clears throat> so as a result of these reductions, the number of state employees we have today is basically been reduced down to what it was 15 years ago in 2002. So that's the, the amount of reduction that, that we have made. Uh, this year's budget from last year, we've eliminated 795 positions. And since I've been in office, it's been 2,259 positions have been, have been eliminated. So um, I know there's a lot of people say we need, to, we need to do some cuts. And I guess the point of that is just to say we've been doing that. We knew that the, the price of entry for new revenues was to make cuts. And we have done that significantly. Since the deficit began in 2013, uh, there's been over $10 billion has been drawn down from our savings to cover the, the de deficit without any new revenues uh, being added. Um, last year, after we made the $1.7 billion reductions, I introduced nine pieces of legislation that would address the uh, budget shortfall, the deficit, and, and uh, not one passed the, the entire legislature. Um, <clears throat> But I must say, I mean, as I've said many times, last uh, last session the Senate did pass the Permanent Fund Protection Act. Uh, it was a, it was a bold step on their part. Uh, some of their members were up for up for election, up for re-election, and they and they did that in the face of that. And I uh, I thank them for that then, and I and I thank them for that now. Uh, this year, the House also passed uh, similar legislation restructuring the uh, the Permanent Fund dividend. And uh, that, too, I thank them for their, their bold step in, in taking that. That's the first time that both bodies had passed, had passed that legislation, so I, I thank them for that. And I just want to mention briefly why it's important that that take place on the restructuring of the permanent fund, is that if we don't, uh, we believe in a couple of years it can be, the program could go completely away, and, and here's why. If there isn't a statutory clear limit on what can be drawn down on, from the uh, permanent fund earnings, I, I'm afraid that um, the dividend will be lost. Um, and the reason for that is that, you know, uh, not this legislature, but future legislatures certainly could draw down more. We'd like to have there some limit on how much can be drawn down on earnings to help fund government. We want to create that, that limit so that it can be drawn down so the permanent fund dividend program will continue. <clears throat> And also, that's why I'm continuing to push for a broad-based broad -based tax. This session, uh, I introduced several new uh, measures but left uh, to bring in revenue, but it left some of the gap still open to let the legislators among themselves decide what could they, what could they, they sort out. Different from last year. Last year, I, I, I submitted a complete nine-piece plan, and, and, uh, which was not, was not uh, accepted. So this year, we did it a, a bit different, leaving it up to their choosing. I continued the session to, to meet with House and Senate uh, leadership, minorities, to, to uh, help assist in any way I could on moving the fiscal issues forward. 
Uh, this session, I applauded the, the bold action of the House in the passage of the full fiscal plan. Now, that's a, that's a, that's a big statement. I mean, that's, a, that's the first time Alaska has had a full fiscal plan that's been passed by, by anybody. We have moved further, and as a result of that passage, than we have in decades towards a, having a, 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 once again, having a, a plan, that, a fiscal plan that we're in control of. That, that it's, it's, that we're, we're, paying, we're paying a portion of that. Uh, so it was that broad-based plan really that allows us to be where we are today. Uh, without that bold move, we we're talking about things today in the way of broad-based that we were not talking about last year. Now, it was not being talked about, at least not uh, openly on, in, in, in uh, floor discussions, and now it is because of what the, what the House has done. <clears throat> Unfortunately, that full plan that was passed by the House this year met with resistance from the Senate. So here we are today. Today is the 141st day of the session of the Alaska State Legislature. Today is the 20th day of the fifth special session that I have called specifically to address the fiscal crisis we have been in since 2013. You know, when I called this special session 20 days ago, I said in, in, a, in, in this room, uh, I said that I would leave it to the legislature to address the balance of the fiscal crisis and pass a budget. But with, with a caveat, I said that when I reached a point that it was necessary for me to send out notices to state employees to give that 30-day notice, at that point my role would, would change a bit. We did send out those notices required to by contract on June 1st. My role did change a bit as a result of that. So today <clears throat> we have 10 days left in the special session. We have 26 days before we have to have a government shutdown and stop the, the government services provided to Alaskans and our visitors. I've visited with each of the four caucuses to learn how close things were as far as what was happening, how close things were to, to, uh, to get across the finish line. I must say I was disappointed they weren't as close as I'd hoped that they had been, and I didn't see any compromise. So as I continue to work with the legislature, I also work with my own administration as we put together a compromise a compromise based upon what we heard from the meetings that, we took, that took place uh, last week when we met with various members of the legislature and, and various caucuses. Now that compromise, which Commissioner Hoppeck is going to go through in a bit, um, was presented to each of the four caucuses yesterday. You know, while no caucus uh, endorsed uh, what, we, what we provided, uh, I do understand the passion uh, of those that have spoken out against the compromise. I'm not wild about the compromise. There are things in there that I've had to compromise, things that I've had to step away from, that I, I made commitments in this room, I made commitments to Alaska on, that I had to stand down on, because I know that wasn't going to happen. So, you know, it's, um, it is a long ways from what I had proposed uh, last session, uh, but it's, it's, it's where we are today. Um, and at this point, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask uh, Commissioner Hoppeck to come up and, and talk uh, to, to walk through the, the, uh, the points of the compromise, and I'll, I'll, uh, I'll finish up after that. Thank you, Governor. And I'm going to just walk through it bill by bill and give you a little bit of an idea of uh, what the balance is within the compromise and uh, a little bit of the thought process behind why those, those particular selections were made. Starting with uh, HB 111, the oil and gas uh, tax reform bill. Um, it uses the Senate's version of HB 111 with the addition of a 100% ring fence provision. And what that does then is essentially eliminates cashable credits and it requires carry forwards to be applied to the field in which they were accrued until that field comes into production. Once the field's in production, the, those, the, those carry forwards can migrate, but they can't migrate until the field is in production. And that way it ensures that investments made in a field will actually result in production. And so it's essentially no production, no credits. It also leaves SB 21 per barrel credit structure in place and it doesn't raise taxes. In doing so, the governor has basically um, uh, taken on two of the points. He had four points that he had originally put out there that he wanted. He wanted to um, uh, reduce or eliminate the cash flow credits. He wanted to make sure that uh, that the credits were used um, to bring fields into production. He wanted to re reduce 
and the liability going forward, and he wanted uh, revenues. In this, with this compromise, he's giving up the reduction in the liability growth, and he's also giving up uh, revenues uh, in this compromise. SB 12, the head tax, is the vehicle that is being proposed as a broad-based tax. It uses a bill already introduced in the Senate uh, with an uplift from the $70 million that that's for projected to uh, uh, generate with an uplift up to $100 million. It addresses some of the uh, concerns that people had with a large infrastructure development for a broad-based tax. In this case, it, it's essentially a payroll deduction and won't uh, require nearly the infrastructure development within the state in order to, uh, to uh, uh, manage the tax. It uh, provides for a bro uh, modest broad-based tax, uh, but it won't overcollect revenues if uh, we see price rebound or we see uh, better than expected uh, returns on our investments. And so it addresses a concern that we would somehow be hyperinflating government spending through, the, uh, through a broad-based tax. It's a very modest tax. In fact, it doesn't even close the deficit entirely. It still leaves a structural deficit that we, quite frankly, think we're going to have to go back and revisit again in the next few years. But we've taken the position that we're willing to um, see whether the forecasts play out, whether the revenues uh, do uh, 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 occur, and uh, and whether the legislature can keep a check on government spending, and uh, if if we can't meet those requirements, we're going to have to go back and revisit it. But at least we'll have a, a tool in place and one that ties the treasury to the economy, so that when we see growth in the economy, we'll see revenues to the treasury. Uh, House, B, House Bill 60 or SB 25, the motor fuel tax, we're ambivalent on which of the two versions pass. We just say pass one of them. Both of the budgets have, uh, have revenues associated with uh, the motor fuel tax embedded within the budgets, so we need, to, we need to address this anyway. We're saying just pass, just pass one of them. Let's move on. Combined with the head tax, uh, the motor fuel tax uh, would generate $180 million in new revenues by year two. So the two revenue pack, the revenues combined, uh, generates $180 million by the second year. Uh, for the permanent fund, SB 26, we use the Senate's version of the bill, which quite frankly requires less new revenues to support. It establishes a formal structure for the use of the earnings reserve uh, and pres therefore preserves the sustainability of the fund and the dividend for future generations. For the operating budget, uh, we look at we're using the House Bill version HB 57 and HB 59 for the operating and mental health budget. That way, it restores the cuts that uh, were made to education and health care, and the result is we protect education, public safety, university, public health, and vulnerable Alaskans, and prevent significant impacts uh, to local communities and schools, as well as uh, protects programs and services during a time of recession. And then SB 23, the capital budget, we don't have a House version of, of, the, of the capital budget. And so what we're proposing is that we, that we uh, use the governor's um, capital budget uh, with the addition of the Senate's deferred maintenance funding pr proposal and also retains the oil and gas tax credit payments within the Senate's budget. And that's consistent with what the governor has said since day one that if we had a structure for a fiscal solution in place, that, that we would pay back those credits. And if we can pull all of these levers this year and bring them in place, then we would start the process of paying back those back credits that are on the books. What does a compromise give us? The House majority and those aligned with it get an operating budget that assures services and programs continue and doesn't pass the burden on to others. They get a broad-based tax structure and the end of cash flow oil and gas credits. In return, 